My name is Daryl Whitman, and uh, I'm, uh, at the moment, uh, at least, uh, an investigator with the uh, U.S. Department of Labor OSHA's Whistleblower Protection Program here in San Francisco. As an investigator, uh, we are, again, we handle 22 uh, statutes uh, that are supposed to provide whistleblower protection to everyone from uh, the, the maid in the, uh, in the hotel to uh, high-level corporate officials uh, who are reporting fraud, in uh, corporate fraud. Uh, and a lot of very technical uh, complaints, people, as I had, and we've talked about this before, I had a high-level official, very, very experienced, uh, very uh, highly regarded in the industry, who was the safety manager at a major uh, nuclear plant. And he blew the whistle, and it was a pretty ugly story after that. <laughs> What plant was that? This was, uh, this was the Humboldt Bay power plant. Mm -hmm. And uh, this fellow, um, basically he had come from the Midwest. Uh, and his expertise was he was in nuclear security. But he also helped uh, Senator Lieberman draft the protocols for decommissioning plants. And so he was, he was more than just an expert. He was a, a very high value person. <clears throat> and he wanted to apply this new knowledge. So uh, when the opportunity was given to him to come out to Humboldt Bay uh, to the nuclear plant, it was going to be the first nuclear plant actually decommissioned where they were going to apply the protocols that he had worked on with the Senate. And he was very excited about it. He, he didn't know a lot about California. He didn't know a lot about PG&E. <laughs> the irony was... He came to California thinking, now he's from Nebraska. He's a surfer. <laughs> he had gotten into being a surfer when he was fairly young and had gone to the Gulf Coast. And of course, he heard the best surfing in the country was in California. <laughs> so in his mind, he was going to be going to a plant that was right on the ocean. So it was going to be a perfect opportunity <laughs> to do surfing. Well, when he got there, he discovered a lot of things. <laughs> Uh, among other things he discovered uh, very early on was the security staff was completely unprepared to do the job. Uh, when he actually started uh, vetting them as far as testing their skill levels and their preparation, half of them he had to fire. Uh, he had, and, and, and nothing against people of, of, of older people, he had a 70 or 8 year old security guard who could not do a push up. <laughs> this is not a good thing. <laughs> Security guards have to be physically capable of putting, you know, of doing the job. Then uh, shortly after that, he began to discover other things about the culture of the region. Now, we're talking Humboldt. <laughs> and he didn't realize, coming from Nebraska, what it means to be living in the Green Triangle. So uh, he discovered that there was an awful lot of drug dealing and drug use going on including people in the plant operating centers. Uh, and, and that, of course, <laughs> was, was his issue. I mean, he's a security director. <clears throat> so what he also didn't understand was when PG&E got the agreement with the local area uh, to build the plant in the first place, <clears throat> they had sort of cut a backroom deal, which was to employ locals. You know, this is a, tra this is a thing you see commonly with, with a lot of uh, plants and, and, and particularly ones that are potentially dangerous that uh, they bribe people they well that's and that's a form of bribery we'll we'll, we'll create yeah, that's right. we'll 500 <laughs> jobs in your neighborhood and for a small area a, you know r fairly remote area Eureka I think has maybe 35,000 people this was a big deal so people were willing at least the officials were o willing to overlook the questions <laughs> because they were going to get jobs on the other hand, PG&E was not discriminating in regard to who was getting the jobs. So you were drawing a large par portion of the plant operators, uh, and not so much the technical operators, but the people who were the security people, uh, people who were performing lower level kinds of jobs coming from the local community, and this is the Green Triangle. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it, it was a problematic arrangement, let's put it that way. Uh, but among other things he discovered very early on 
was that the plant had misplaced fuel rods. <laughs> they couldn't account for all the fuel rods. <laughs> you know, it was just kind of a litany of things like this. That's a pretty serious issue. This yes, it is. Yes, it is. I mean, uh, the question was, did they actually lose them or it was just an accounting problem? <laughs> but in any case, that's a very serious matter. That's a breach, security breach, an enormous security breach. Uh, then later he discovered that they had a, a pond, you know, storage area for uh, nuclear fuel rods that was within 100 feet of a popular hiking trail. <laughs> and people just didn't know. I mean, people in the local area just didn't know. PG&E is very good at its propaganda campaigns. <laughs> so they had maintained, you know, a, a relationship with a lot of the local media, with a couple of exceptions. Uh, to sell the idea that this was good for the area and that there really were problems. And Zane was a problem for them because Zane was a real straight shooter. Uh, Christian, uh, church-going guy, uh, you know, the, the classic middle American, you know, he's worked his way up from being uh, a farm farm boy in, a, in effect, got his training, you know, he, he made the grade, he became... Uh, an important person in the nuclear industry in the nation. So, you know, he's very proud of that. He had very high professional standards. And uh, he was very surprised that PG&E did not have high professional standards. <laughs> Wait <a minute. laughs> This is over and over again. The same story. You know, it's amazing. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So, so what... What happened? Well, ultimately, he started reporting. He had, he knew people in the uh, NRC, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and they come out and do fairly regular audits of these places. Uh, and he knew people in, in the NRC. They knew him because he had a big reputation. And um, he, at one point, he got crosswise with PG&E for complaining about them not properly building out the uh, security uh, apparatuses to protect the plant during the decommissioning process. He also discovered that there was a certain amount of shifting of funding <laughs> going on uh, and that they were hiring local contractors who were not necessarily qualified to do work. So he kept bringing this up with the plant manager. <clears throat> so what they did is they demoted him <laughs> and they promoted his, his senior aide who he had trained so, of course, the senior aide that comes up and becomes the security uh, manager and Zane steps back and he's no longer the security manager, he's a, a Zane too. <laughs> and he, you know, continues the process. He was conscientious too. He yes, he, Zane, Zane gave him good training and good ethics and good standards to work with, even though he was a local boy and he didn't have a lot of background when he first started working. Uh, Zane identified these qualities and, and thought they were important and that he was someone they could work with. Well, ultimately, uh, they, they fired a couple of people in the plant for, well, <laughs> it's not important why they fired them, except that they had good grounds to fire them. And these, these two people ha had connections in the local community. So they went on the war path to get rid of them. And at the same time, the plant manager obviously was very unhappy. There's a lot of evidence of, of retaliation beyond even having him demoted uh, and hostility, animus towards him by many plant managers. Uh, then it, they scheduled, the NRC scheduled an audit. And in the context of that audit, uh, I think that the plant manage, management hit a panic button because the auditors wanted to talk to Zane. And he was no longer. <laughs> and that raised a lot of questions with the auditors. And uh, his junior, the, the guy who had taken over for him, was very forthcoming. And in fact, at the end of the audit, <clears throat> the senior auditor publicly, in front of management, praised uh, the, 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 the guy that took over for, for Zane, praised him for his candor. <laughs> and within a... 72 hours, he was toast, <laughs> along with Zane. <laughs> but I think that the real troubling part of the case, I mean, this, this is a classic kind of whistleblower uh, case. You know, people report something that's serious for whatever reason, 
managers don't like what they're hearing, they don't want to hear bad news, or they get crosswise with them you know, professionally in some ways, and they just want to get rid of them. They're, they're, they're the, the squeaky wheel. Uh, so that's, that's fairly classy. In the case of PG&E, uh, what was not classic was the way they went after him after they fired him. And how did they go after him? Well, they, they, <laughs> they uh, trashed his reputation. To work in a nuclear plant, you have to have security clearance. So they put things into the, into the pipeline that said he was, he was dishonest. And uh, which was really extraordinary. I mean, this man is probably the most honest person in the plant. <laughs> but uh, they put it in the pipeline, you know, in the record, and he, he had actually gone back to the Midwest to, to where he started, where he's working, to accept a position back there. And then as soon as they found out that this information was there, they pulled his license, you see, his credentials. So he couldn't work in the nuclear industry. Well, what do you do if you're a specialist in the nuclear industry? There's not a lot of transfer of experience to some other profession. His career was being ruined. His career was being ruined. And then uh, the people inside the industry, a lot of them knew him, respected him, wanted to have him work for them because of his skill sets. Uh, and one of the companies involved uh, tried to give him a job and you know, try to help facilitate and get this problem. Well, unfortunately, they also had some contracts with PG&E. And when PG&E found out they were trying to help him, they canceled the contracts with the company. <laughs> so would you say this is a criminal conspiracy to retaliate against uh, people who are protecting health and safety at nuclear plants? Well, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's, that's a criminal conspiracy. Um, I don't think I would say a criminal conspiracy. It certainly, it certainly is a pattern. You know, conspiracy is about intent, and uh, it's hard with a company, big companies, to really identify the, the the decision makers. And that was true in this case. It's true in almost every case I have with big companies. The motives behind doing what they do can take a range again from personal animus to the fact that this this person is hurting their their profits, <laughs> and we've got to figure out somehow how to isolate them, how to get rid of them. And I'm not sure that's a criminal conspiracy. It could be. You, you think know, it should be? I the think... company conspires to retaliate against somebody so they ruin his career because he's well, been a whistleblower? The, the, the problem with making it a criminal... I mean, a blanket kind of criminal thing is you kind of overlook the, some of the de important details when you do that. And when you have a criminal... The standard of... of uh, proof in a criminal case is much higher than in a civil case. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a real downside potentially to doing that. But you know, in uh, when the, the, the idea of OSHA first came up and whistleblower program first came up back at the end of the Johnson, Johnson administration, the proposal included power for OSHA to go in and shut down companies when they're in situations like that, when there were repeated offenses and in fact, I think they did it very early on, once or twice. And of course, that was not popular with the National Association of Manufacturers. <laughs> so by the time it came around to the early part of the Nixon administration, uh, OSHA, the, the bill had passed, uh, OSHA was in place, uh, and it, had, it actually had some teeth here and there. But it was still... Uh, a very new agency, and it's really stirred a lot of opposition. So there was a lot of negotiations went on to weaken OSHA from the beginning. But in, in, uh, in, in the early 1970s, the other thing that happened was you had the Nixon administration, uh, you had close relationship with uh, business, particularly big business. They didn't like OSHA. They didn't like anything about OSHA. They want something done. So there was inside, this is, this is the official history that OSHA will print it itself. There was an agreement that OSHA would cease to be an aggressive uh, enforcement agency to protect workers and the public, and it would be a collaborative agency which would sit down with companies and uh, you know, talk through issues, issue standards, which they do, they still do that, it's a big part of OSHA, 
Uh, but they really withdrew from being a critical enforcement agency. And that began a culture inside of OSHA that said, well, whatever Congress says in the laws say, our role is really just to be supporting companies. We want to help companies. We, we want to help companies. And it got, it got pretty notorious in the 80s under the Reagan administration because there were companies, and it still is notorious in my thinking, there were companies that had, were multiple offenders um, and, they, and OSHA had the power you know, to find companies they supposedly go and investigate, and, and when they do, and establish, it, they can they can have fines, million dollar fines, if they want. But what they would do is they would lowball the fines, then they would sit down and negotiate almost all of it away <laughs> with the company, get the company to sign on to an agreement. Well, we'll do this, we'll do that, we'll do this. But there's no follow up. And it's very easy to make an agreement. What's important is if the agreements are enforced. Then you have, you know, you have a different situation. Well, I think, you know, my sense of it is they make a lot of agreements and that's the end of it. They never follow through, never, rarely follow through uh, to actually ensure that companies are following the rules. So you, um, this was your first, uh, you know, case. This was one of my first cases. cases. And, the, and you, and this, did this, he filed an OSHA complaint? Right. And it was dismissed. <laughs> and why did they dismiss it? That's a good question because I recommended it as a merit case. I what does a merit case mean? A merit case means I found, according to the statute, which is the uh, Energy Reorganization Act, ERA, has the whistleblower provision in it. And it, it makes cer certain standards for doing an investigation, and I felt I'd covered that. And there's just so much evidence. Uh, and in fact, there were. There were two other investigations that were done in the same case, came to the same conclusion I did. Uh, so I, I felt like I was joining uh, with other people who had conducted other parts of an, uh, of an inve investigation and came to the same conclusion. And there was just huge amounts of evidence of animus, of you know, reporting these, these, uh, these, these kind of incidents inside of PG&E, inside of the plant. It, to me, it was a classic whistleblower case. But one of the things that happened during the course of the investigation, uh, and, and I do this is, uh, with my private practice, and I have always done this, is try to talk to the opposing parties, you know, because you want to get a sense of who knows what, why, what's their real intentions. And there's actually a, a provisions in our investigative manual for trying to pursue some kind of an early settlement, both so we don't string it out too long, and we give the parties an opportunity to, to resolve the issue when it's not going to cost either one of them an arm and a leg. Uh, so that was part of my training. It was also part of my professional life was to do that. So I started talking to the attorney for PG&E. And I sent uh, uh, early on, fairly early on after I'd conducted a, a big part of the investigation and I was coming to conclude you know, that this was a merit case, I was going to recommend recommend merit. Um, uh, I, I sent a summary of my investigation to the attorney for PG&E, and we were actually having some pretty reasonable professional discussions about possibly resolving the case. And it was around Christmas time, and after Christmas, this attorney disappeared. <laughs> To be replaced by the Wicked Witch of the West. <laughs> and who was that? I don't know her name. I don't remember her name. But it was it was a completely different attitude and approach than I had had with the first attorney. And she complained. I, I thought it was amazing. She complained that I had sent a summary of the investigation to them. Why? She claimed I was pressuring them. <laughs> And threatening them. <laughs> I thought, well, that's remarkable. I certainly wouldn't have gotten that from the other attorney. <laughs> and that's never, I mean, that's never the intention. You can't do that and actually come to a, a credible, you know, uh, resolution of, of, of anything. You can't bully people into having a good faith settlement. Uh, I think every parent can realize that. You know, there, there are consequences to doing that. So you just don't do that. It's unprofessional. But she, she called up my supervisor and complained. 
about me. And suddenly it was like I was the bad guy. You were the problem. I was the problem because I was asking. <laughs> I was doing an investigation. It was leading to the conclusion that PG&E had violated the law. <laughs> Not allowed, I guess, in the program. Um, and that's where I think I began to really understand the problems with the program. Uh, that it wasn't as advertised. We're not protecting whistleblowers. In fact, you could argue that we are actually protecting the companies from whistleblowers. Because in the end, when you don't protect whistleblowers, people go through these experiences. You know, it gets around a business. Uh, every place that we have this kind of a complaint, and I have lots of them, that workplace, you're not going to find anybody else stepping forward to report missing nuclear fuel rods because <laughs> they don't want to go through that and it's it's, it's a it's a um it's a lesson that they learn not to be a whistleblower and what does that mean for the public at a nuclear plant I mean, well at a nuclear plant you know uh it means we don't know <laughs> which is the worst part of it and if you have a situation you know we had a a, a situation down at songs uh, san onofre uh, which turned into a, quite a fiasco, and they eventually did shut uh, San Onofre. But uh, there's a lot of problems with nuclear plants, and uh, you know probably better than I what the problems are, but it's really clear that as these plants age, they're going to have problems. And as this case for, told me, when you have problems and you're going to close down a nuclear plant, what do you do with it? First of all, it's expensive. And what these companies, these utilities that built them, you know, they never factored in the costs <laughs> of deactivation and maintenance of these plants. It was always, you know, short-term profit over long-term uh, accountability. So as with trying to decommission uh, uh, Humboldt Bay, uh, the fact that the PG&E was, uh, I don't want to say this as a fact because I didn't see the documents, but... I certainly heard that money w that was that was earmarked for decommissioning was not necessarily going for decommissioning. Plus, the way that they were managing the decommissioning didn't reflect a high level of concern about the public safety. Obviously, if you've lost rods, you're putting um, you're, you're putting uh, spent fuel rods a hundred hundred feet from a path. You're not evidencing much respect for the public interest. I wouldn't say allowing. If you're tolerating a drug culture inside the plant, do you want a stoner in running the plant? <laughs> you know, if you just missed the, got the wrong button, you know, this one was red, it looked attractive, so I hit that one instead. <laughs> you know, th these are the way, this is the way that accidents happen. And uh, the history so this of this could be catastrophic. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I had nightmares about the, the situation for a while because my daughter's, one of her best friends was going to Humboldt State University, which was about 10 miles downwind of the nuclear plant. And I'm thinking, you know, a lot of people up there, they're in, they don't know what this plant is, particularly if they, they're fairly recent uh, uh, residents, the university people. They're kind of insulated from what's the reality of where they live and what's going on around them. And to, ha to know that this plant was sitting there being mismanaged at this level uh, and knowing you know, that I have personal friends <laughs> that could potentially be at risk, it does give you nightmares. You know, uh, it's, it's one of those things uh, that you can't, you, can't, you can't bring it back. You know, if, if they had a serious accident, a serious release, uh, a ten, 10 miles is not very far. Uh, and particularly in that neighborhood where there's pretty persistent southwest winds, you know, it would carry the, the material very quickly over to Arcata or to, you know, certainly into to, uh, Eureka. Uh, and all those people would be a risk. And under those circumstances, why did the government agencies decide to go along with PG&E and covering this up? Well, I'm not sure I would say covering it up. They didn't want to uncover it. <laughs> they wanted to bury it. It's, it's part, of, part of it is that culture from the 70s, which is we don't confront particularly big companies. 
we work with them. And there's a whole litany of cases I can, I can cite where this has happened. West Texas, you know, the fertilizer plant that blew up. That was under the responsibility of OSHA to uh, review that plant on a regular basis and ensure that it wasn't vi in violation of the law. Well, the storage of the fertilizer at that at West Texas was like four or five times beyond the level that was approved. It was a it was a ticking time bomb, and it went off. <laughs> well, this was federal OSHA. This is federal OSHA, so absolutely. Why wasn't federal OSHA doing the inspections of that? Plant? Well, they did every twenty five years. <laughs> I mean, the Dallas Morning Herald did a great story about it. If anybody wants to, you know, if, wants to look up West Texas and, and Dallas Morning Herald, and they pointed to a lot of failures that led up to that explosion. And one of them, of course, is OSHA wasn't there. They weren't there for 25 years. And OSHA will say, well, we didn't have the resources to go down and look at this plant. But there's a lot of... there's. According to the Dallas, uh, to the story in the Dallas Herald, Morning Herald, th there are other factors. Uh, senator Obama blocked, when he was a senator in Illinois, he, he was taking money from this industry and he blocked the kind of regulation that would have forced more oversight and, and stronger controls over these storage plants. So, I mean, he has his fingers in this too. And when he went to the memorial for the people yeah. at, at that plant in the community that was destroyed, right. he didn't mention that Federal Ocean was responsible. For I know, the I know. Was we, that a mistake? Or no, no, I don't think there's ever a mistake in politics. <laughs> and, you know, and, and in fairness, he, I don't think he necessarily sat there in, in 2006 or 2004, whatever it was, and said, oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to defeat this bill because I want West Texas to blow up. But it's the idea of big money in politics and politicians who take money from, from these kinds of, of uh, companies and these kinds of associations, they're compromising the public interest. And one of the interests of the public is in health and safety, you know. And protecting workers. And protecting workers. So they're not retaliated against. Exactly. Them. And that was what your job was. That was my job.